Good morning and welcome to the webinar. It's uh, 11 o'clock, so we get underway. Um, a fresh look at growth and exit strategies for 2021 is co-hosted by the FD Centre and PM Corporate Finance. So uh, thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedule to join us today. Um, before we kick off with the presentations, just a couple of housekeeping points. Um, the webinar will finish at 12 noon and we're um, keep to time. Um, to save you the effort of scribbling down notes, we will be providing a recording of, of the webinar and a summary of each of the presentations after the event. Um, you'll notice that there's a Q&A box below in the toolbar. Um, if any questions come to mind during the webinar, please type them into that box. There will be an opportunity to pose questions to our speakers once the presentations have completed. Um, thank you to everyone who has submitted a question uh, ahead of the webinar today. Um, our first presentation will be delivered by Jerry Gilbert from the FD Centre. He will be talking about the entrepreneurial journey and the role of the FD. Um, we'll be hearing from Philip Alaganju at PM Corporate Finance, who will be discussing the impact of COVID on exits and valuation, and also a little bit on acquisition. Um, that will be followed by Jeremy Hyde, um, who's talking about getting your house in order uh, before acquirers come calling. And to conclude the webinar, Lake Faulkner will be discussing your choices when it comes to exiting and the current market for mergers and acquisitions. Um, so get us underway. Um, Jerry, it's over to you. Thank you very much indeed, Sean, and welcome everybody to this webinar, which is uh, my element is going to be talking about the entrepreneurial journey and uh, talking about how we can help business owners navigate their business through these uncertain times and realise the business's full potential. Um, I'm delighted to be on the webinar today. Uh, we've got, um, I look after the Northern Home Counties uh, for the FD Centre, and we've also got uh, Jeremy Hyde, who looks after the East of England North region, and uh, another colleague, Ryan Oates, who looks after the East of England South region, who's not presenting, but is, uh, is, is on the call. And as Sean has said, we, we also have, we are co-presenting with two of PEM's partners, uh, Lake and Philip, and uh, and PEM are a highly respected, very, very well-established firm of accountants in Cambridgeshire and have built up a super uh, advisory practice in helping businesses uh, in the lead up to and all the way through the selling process. But what I'm here to talk to you about is how we see our role in helping business owners get their business ready for sale. And it all starts off, if I can uh, get my, it all starts off with asking a very simple question. It's really trying to work out what you want. What do you, the business owner or business owners, want your business to do for you? And if you engage with the FD Centre, you'll find that we spend a lot of time in the early stages listening and understanding what that means for you, because we understand that every business owner is different and they want something different out of their business. And it's only by understanding that, that we can work out really what is the right plan for your business. We don't apply a, a template to your business. We listen first before getting to work. So I'm a simple man and I like pictures. So, uh, so I, I, I hope that pictures work for you as well. What we have here is, is I'm gonna draw a picture on the screen and the uh, horizontal axis is time. The vertical axis is the things that really matter to you and your business. And you know what? It doesn't really matter to us what those are. Those might be profitability. That might be turnover. That might be a certain number of projects. Uh, that you want to achieve in a year, a certain number of clients, whatever really matters to you. And the important bit on this, on this picture now is that green dot, and that's the bit where we start talking to you. And businesses that we 
talk to have, have grown they, through the energy, through the energy and dynamism of the owners. They have built their business to a certain size and there are usually one of a number of triggers that results in in them coming to our door. And sometimes they don't come to our door. And as we all know, the stark realities are that two out of three small businesses do fail. And what we know from businesses who do end up coming back to us is that sometimes the business owners' ambitions haven't quite been realised. But those who we do engage with and who we are working with, well, quite exciting things start happening. And the first thing that we will get to work on with your business are really looking at the engine room of your business and some of the underlying facets of your business that may not deliver an immediate top line benefit, but will certainly deliver a strong bottom line benefit to the business. So those are things like your relationship with your firm of accountants. Is that working well for the business? Are they being given good information in a timely fashion? How's your tax planning? Are the contracts fit for purpose around the business? Um, those outsourced relationships that you've got, whether that's leaseholds, whether that's insurance policies, whether that's equipment, whatever that is, let's make sure those agreements are in your benefit. And also your relationship with your bank. Um, the events of uh, 2020 have taught us many things, one of which is that uh, that relationship with your bank can be really important. So those are some underlying support elements of the business, but then we would like to get stuck in to the engine room of your business with you. So those are things like your systems and your processes. And let's make sure in that, that there's no loss of time efficiency, which equals money, either in the systems that you've got not talking to each other properly, or human intervention slowing things down. We want to make sure that the reporting that you are, you, your leadership team, your FD, are using to plan the future of the business is fit for purpose. And when we say fit for purpose, we don't simply mean an extract from zero or sage. What we mean is a contextualized report that puts your business front and center and its growth, its future plans front and center to enable you, your leadership team, including your FD, to plan the future of the business. We obviously want your business to be as profitable as it can be. You're working hard, your team is working hard. It, the business needs to be as profitable as possible. So what can be done to improve that? Whether that's uh, increase products and services to existing clients, whether that's taking your existing products and services to new clients, whether that's pricing, all sorts of areas that we can work on with you to make sure that your profitability is maximized. And we'll also look at the cash flow within the business. Jeremy's going to be talking about the importance of cash flow in, in more detail later, but it's important that that cash flow is right and that you have a good understanding, not just of where the business is today, but where the business is going into the future and that the cash sits in the right place. So that's all operational stuff. And that's really good um, because that will deliver significant benefits to you and your business. But where the FD center has demarcated itself, where we really want to add value for you and your clients and where we do add value um, for you and your clients is by working on the strategic benefits. And one of the important, the most important elements of that is the eventual exit of the business. And as we've already mentioned, Philip and Lake are gonna be talking about um, leading up to and taking you through the sale of your business. And that, that might be a dynamic process because there were many businesses that might have planned to have sold by now. And the events of 2020 and, and into this year have changed those plans. And, and we and any other advisors that you engage, whether, whether that, that be PEM, um, we understand that these are dynamic times and we need to be flexible around you, your business and its needs. Uh, we will also identify any risks 
that are facing the business. Now that might sound a little bit dry, but I'm just gonna give you an example of one of the clients who we work with in the Northern Home Counties. And um, this business uh, brings in raw materials and turns them into cardboard boxes. And in 2019, the business was turning over some 25 million pounds. And RFD was a little bit concerned about a virus that was going on in China, which was where this business sourced all of its raw materials. And he suggested to the owner that they introduce greater resilience to that supply chain. So he opened up supply channels from Turkey and India. When the world ran out of cardboard packaging in April, May last year, our client cleaned up and doors that had been shut to them were firmly, were, 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 were flung wide open and they were able to put in place contracts at good terms and strong margins that saw the business last year to turn over just shy of 60 million pounds. Now, I'd like to say we've been able to achieve that for all of our clients, we haven't, but the purpose of looking at the risks is that we are eyes and ears looking over your shoulders and ideally we will avoid the ripples coming to shore at all, but if they are heading to shore, we will make sure that we have mitigated them as strongly as possible. We'll also look at your business plan. Again, it's a dynamic issue. Let's make sure that your business plan reflects your ambitions and the possible aspirations of your business and make sure that that is kept up to date. And many businesses, and again, Jeremy's gonna to touch on this, the importance of the business being well-funded. Sometimes uh, growth can be funded from cash flow within the business. Sometimes you might need to look outside the business to, uh, to, to fund that growth. We can help you achieve that. And then sitting alongside all of this, at the bottom of the screen here, I've put work plans. And again, that sounds slightly dry, but when they come to life in your business, this is a document, a living document, that uh, ensures that you and your FD are aligned. And that prioritizes what we should be working on this month, the next three months, six months, 12 months down the line so that we all are aligned in our, in our responsibilities and we all know what we're delivering to the business. So that was just a brief introduction, ladies and gentlemen, to uh, the entrepreneurial journey. I'm now gonna hand over to Philip, who's going to discuss possible exit strategies in a post-COVID world. So over to you, Philip. Hi everyone, morning, my name is Philip and for some strange reason my presentation is at the very end rather than at the beginning, so technical fault but we will uh, ignore that, there you go, ha! yeah that's the slide that I wanted to um, start with. I'm a partner at Corporate Finance here at PEM um, and I'll be discussing exit strategies for a post-Covid world. Uh, the impact of Covid and uncertainty on valuations and, and how you'll be affected and whether now is the right time to grow via acquisition. And it's a great thing that um, I've got my slides in the right way so we can, uh, we can dive in. When, when it comes to the word strategy, I think there's a lot of um, flippant and incorrect usage out there in the world. Essentially, a strategy is a plan of action designed to achieve an overall aim. So before we can talk about exit, really, we need to understand what your day-to-day -day strategy is and the day-to-day -day actions that um, already need to be in place. So, so literally aligned with, with Jerry's earlier presentation, um, there are 10 uh, post-COVID, what I like to call commandments, um, that need to be in place before redeveloping any kind of exit strategy. So. Um, diving in, number one sounds obvious, right? Detailed cash flows. But you need to have detailed and robust cash flow forecasts to enable you to understand the impact of any decisions you make right now and those, uh, th those decisions and their impact on cash effectively. Number two, good management information. It's crucial 
uh, for making good decisions to have good management information and be able to access it um, at the right time. Number three, you've got to be able to interrogate your pipeline to assess the level of activity and likelihood of new work coming in through the door. Number four, you need a deep review of your supply chain to remove any inefficiencies. I think that's been really um, interesting over the last 12 months, um, given what Jerry touched upon earlier on in terms of um, supply chain from the Far East. Um, that's something to kind of keep an eye on uh, repeatedly. Really. Um, number five, you need to have a detailed analysis of staffing levels to measure productivity. Um, number six, this is another obvious one, but we, you know, we need to stay close to your customers and to your clients um, so you can react when they need you to react um, rather than be reactive, if that makes sense. Um, number seven, identify any competitive advantages and do that early. Um, number eight, communicate, communicate, communicate internally. This just drives confidence, not only in terms of the management team and the people who are leading the business, but also the staff who are there to kind of drive the business forward. Um, number nine, again, that kind of links to number one, uh, retain cash, keep cash um, on your balance sheet for contingencies. Um, it's always important to have a rainy day fund, right? Um, and, and number 10, be decisive, make decisions and stick with them. And these commandments will stabilize your business and create bandwidth for growth. Um, and once these commandments are in place, um, it's time to start to implement a three stage review referred to in, in academic circles as the Phoenix encounter, right? Essentially, you're just theoretically burning down your company um, to the ground and building it back up in, in three um, in three stages. Stage number one is, is you review the current status of the business. Um, you can crack on with a, with a SWOT analysis, that's um, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities and threats. Um, review your mission, review the strategic priorities in your business, um, kind of sort of base level, base level stuff, right? Then you move on to stage number two. Um, identify any factors which may potentially destroy your business. So, for example, we're seeing a lot in terms of emerging technologies, a business model innovation, um, traditional businesses are shifting from kind of a, um, high street um, delivery to digital and virtual delivery. Um, you know, so good management teams need to stay ahead of the curve in, in that regard. Um, Digitalization is kind of a continuum of that. Um, societal shifts and changing, um, to changing consumer behaviors. Uh, these are things that you need to kind of identify and stay on top of. And then stage three, just finalize your defensive plan, which includes a new strategic leadership if needed, um, organizational priorities being re reshifted, um, and short, medium, and long-term action plans. Um, and what does this all mean in terms of exit, right? This is all kind of nice, uh, strategic stuff. What does it mean in terms of nuts and bolts? Well, number one, it means get your business in the best possible shape, operationally, strategically, and financially. And with that last component piece, you could possibly get help from from the likes of Jerry and Jeremy from from the FD Centre in terms of just just making sure that your finance offering is a little bit more robust than it is right now. Number two, it's kind of a side note here, but identify your successes and develop them, and do it now. Um, scalable businesses, number three, um, with well-developed strategies continue to attract a lot of acquisitive interest. And I'm just going to segue here because I think there's a really big difference. I've actually discussed this with my wife last night. There's a really big difference between growth and scalability. And I think those terms are just kind of thrown around willy-nilly um, out there in the ether. Growth essentially means revenue increases at the same rate as the cost incurred to enable that growth. So if you think about a McDonald's, for example, McDonald's franchise, that grows in terms of the number of sites it has, number of restaurants it has. And the more restaurants it has, the more revenue it generates, but the more restaurants it has, the more cost it generates as well. That's growth. Um, but in terms of scalability, that's where revenue increases at a faster rate than costs are incurred. So typically we see IT companies have been scalable because their overheads are pretty low to begin with, but the revenue just grows and grows and grows. Um, and that's what a scalable business looks like. So, I mean, let's fast forward on to, to valuation. How does this all impact on valuation in terms of the COVID uncertainty and, and all the things I've discussed so far? Well, over the last year or so, it's been quite interesting. We've, we've become increasingly familiar with a new acronym, um, EBITDAC. 
um, earnings before interest, tax, depreciation, amortization, and, and COVID. And this kind of takes into, um, into uh, consideration the underlying performance of the business having adjusted for the impact of the coronavirus. And the logic here is that one must now look at the 2019 numbers, um, EBITDAC for, for 2020 into 2021, given that we're, all, we're still in kind of this, this pandemic, although things are, are rapidly improving due to the vaccine rollout, and, and, then, and then forecast for, for 2022 and beyond. We need to consider all of those things when, when we're talking about evaluation. So, so historic results referring to 2019 don't really look too relevant in the short term. So there will be more of an emphasis on current and forecast numbers. And so in terms of trends and value drivers that Lake and I and the rest of the team are seeing currently, um, valuation multiples have held. I've, I've, I've talked about kind of scalable business, so um, software, healthcare, tech sectors, we've seen those multiples holding pretty steady. Startups have and will continue to face uh, pretty strong headwinds and more cautious valuations, because I guess it's, it's slightly, slightly trickier to start a business during a pandemic than it is uh, when, when there isn't a virus out there killing people and making people feel very ill, right? Um, deal prices are continuing to hold up for transactions um, where we've seen businesses attract strategic buyers. And I always say uh, strategic buyers are buyers where they're attracted to your business because they can't do what you have. They can't, they can't replicate what you have, whether that's the management team, whether that's the intellectual property, or IP, or, or, or whatever. So they're willing to pay more, right? And, and, and another type of buyer, the, the, the private equity community, they, they, they've remained very much open for business, um, but their valuations have dipped sort of about 20% in the short term. Um, and, and recent surveys of, of, of M&A kind of advisors, including those from data provider Mark to Market, who we work with very closely, found that most um, SME advisors are cautiously optimistic about valuations holding in the short term. And, and then I guess in terms of these value drivers, buyers will remain focused on things like cash generation, scalability, as I've touched upon already, intellectual property, defensibility, and, and, and strength of management. And so you know, talking about that, you know, When's the obvious time to, to grow via acquisition? Um, and that's a picture of a management team there. And so is now the time to grow um, via acquisition? And I guess uh, the short term answer is, is yes. According to research carried out by the Boston Consulting Group, weak economy deals yield, if you can believe it, 9% higher total shareholder returns than strong economy deals when measured over a two year period post completion. And as we've seen at PBM Corporate Finance, the technology is in place to, to complete transactions. Lake will touch upon it um, later on, but we've closed a, a significant number of deals in the last 12 months, and we've got more to come in the short term. Um, vendors are more receptive to increasing um, risk sharing components in terms of structuring, earn out payment structures and funding deals on vendor loan notes have become really, really um, popular. Uh, and so the key takeaways uh, from all of this talk um, that I've given, that number one, be prepared, be prepared. Uh, put in place an ongoing target screening process that covers strategic priorities. Do that kind of Phoenix encounter process. Burn your business down to the ground theoretically, but build it back up and focus on the things that make your business unique um, and saleable, I guess. Number two, be bold. Boldly pursue any downturn M&A opportunities if they materialize, you know, downturns are on average uh, good times to do deals. Uh, the news and the media will, will, will have you believe that you know we're coming out of Armageddon, but it hasn't actually been that bad from a business perspective, depending on what you do, of course. And there'll be a lot of businesses out there where the owners, um, frankly, are fatigued and, and are looking at their exit strategy. So now might be the time to knock on some doors and un unearth some, some opportunities in that way. And, and number three, be transformative. Use transformational deals to stay ahead of the curve and accelerate out of any kind of you know, recessionary or downturn environment so that you're ahead of the curve when, when the upturn um, returns. Um, and if all that fails, make sure that you 
<laughs> by by your toilet roll. That gag has gone now because you've all seen that image, which is a shame. But um, <laughs> yeah, hopefully that still tickled your ribs. Um, I'll now hand over to Jeremy, who will share some case studies on operational, strategic, and um, financial benefits of, of having management support from a FD perspective. Over to you, Jeremy. Thank you, Phil Philip, and um, good morning, everyone. So. Um, Great to listen to the two presentations from um, Philip and Jerry. And actually, if you're looking to grow the profitability of your business uh, and you're looking to uh, to, to exit, then um, all you need to know really is in those two great uh, discussions. What I'd like to do over the next few minutes is really bring to life uh, some of the theories and the information that you've uh, heard in those two discussions. and. Uh, I'm going to use two case studies. The first is a building services company that we worked with. And uh, this was a profitable business, making profits of around 4.6 million, but it was burning cash. And in the year before we started working with this business, it consumed 3.3 um, million in cash flow. So we took a look under the bonnet of the financials and, and we identified that uh, just a 1% improvement across seven key levers in this business could improve uh, the profitability of this business by 924,000. And more importantly, could have increased the cash flow by over a million. And um, just making sure that my screen share is on. Hopefully you can all see that. Thanks. So um, just a 1% increase in um, uh, across seven key levers could improve the profitability of this business by 2.1 million. And more importantly, increase cash flow by 3.8 million. And as you can see from the slide here, a key contributor to the um, improvement in this business was in pricing. And when we suggest to our clients sometimes about increasing pricing, uh, we're often met with a look of horror. And if I increase my prices, I'm going to lose uh, business to the competition. And that may well be true. So increasing price, uh, prices is not something to be done without thinking it through carefully first. And this business was no exception. There were a number of customers that um, would have struggled with a, a significant price increase. On the other hand, there are a number, some of them hadn't had a price increase for over three years. They were much more focused on the, the product quality or the service that they were getting and were quite comfortable with a price increase. The net impact of that was an increase in 2.1 million in profits and 1.7 million in cash flow. Another key area for the improvement was in debtor days. And we find many clients have got significant amounts tied up uh, in debtors. And with an active finance and credit control function, chasing down those outstanding debts or contacting major customers before they're due uh, to pay, just before they're due to pay, is a great way to reduce the amount of cash flow and working capital tied up in these areas. But even before you sell and start doing business with the customers, uh, negotiating terms that recognise the, uh, the strains on working capital that you might have up front is a great way to uh, help reduce the investment in working capital tied up in this area. And like pricing, uh, cash flow and, and the terms in this business, it wasn't a case of just increasing uh, the ter or changing the terms with all the customers. There were many customers that were quite cash sensitive. They enjoyed the terms that they had. They didn't really want to change. So it was a case of us going through the different customer groups, working out those that were comfortable with that. There were some that were quite happy. They, they weren't particularly cash sensitive. They were quite happy to pay advance payments, progress payments on some of the long range uh, contracts and, and projects that were underway. And also with some of the repeat customers, we were able to move across to direct debit, which meant that negated the need for chasing up every month for payment for late payers. And it meant that we could get the cash earlier. 
The net impact of all that work was a 1.7 million improvement in cash flow. And one of the paradoxes of the business world, and, and both Jerry and uh, Philip have touched on this cash flow issue, and certainly over the next year or so, as we go into the recovery, which is exciting times for us all, um, ramping up your business, increasing your sales, can put strains on working capital. So managing cash flow and really taking a balanced view. It's great to increase sales volume, but it's also important to manage the cash flow as well, and ensure that you've got the funds uh, to uh, continue. And the, and the paradox that I alluded to is that businesses that run out of cash, it's very often those that are doing really well. They're growing their sales line and they're almost victims of their success. So we always say that uh, cash is king. It's the lifeblood of your business. So managing and taking a balanced view across cash flow and pro uh, profitability, really important. But what does all this mean? In this case, we've improved the profitability of the business by 2.1 million. We increased cash flow by 3.8 million. But what about the value of the business? Well, as a result of the work that we did here, this business increased in value by 10.4 million pounds. And at the time when we first started working with the business, had the business sold the proceeds from the sale, less the debts that the owner had, the, the owner was effectively in a negative equity position to the tune of 300,000. As a result of the improvements that we put in place here, the bit that that owner was now worth over 10 million pounds. And it's important to say at this point that this was focused at this time purely on the operational factors. It was the same systems, uh, same um, customers, the same products and services, but we were managing the financials much more effectively, particularly the cash flow. Net impact, 10.4 million pounds. I have another case study to share with you, which touches on some of the strategic aspects and some of those as other aspects about exit and preparing for exit that um, Philip talked to us about. This was a, a business, a, a multi-channel retail organization. Um, it was originally set up by a wife and husband team. They set the business up from their front room and the business grew and eventually they needed to move to some dedicated retail premises. And that growth journey continued. And uh, eventually they outgrew those, uh, those premises and needed to move to a much bigger site. And it was nearly 25, 30 years later, the business at this point had grown to 20 million turnover. But the problem was, it wasn't particularly profitable and there were cash flow issues. So they reached out and uh, asked for help. And we took a look under the bonnet of the financials and we identified a number of areas where we could improve the profitability and the cash flow of the business. Um, this business had been growing really well, but the systems and process they had, they probably outgrown them. They needed to move to more sophisticated systems and processes dealing with inventory management, the return of sales on a much bigger scale. They also needed better people. They needed higher caliber people to deal with this, what was a much more complex and sophisticated business. But the real challenge, so that was the operational aspects. The real challenge was how are we going to continue growing this business? It had grown really well over nearly 30 years. How are we going to take this business forward and continue that rapid growth? And this was at the time when uh, online marketing was really uh, a key part of uh, business strategy and it was getting more popular everywhere. And that became a key part of the uh, strategic sales and marketing uh, strategic plan for this business, as did geographical expansion overseas. And as we worked with the, the business, it became clear that the end in mind, what really mattered to the business was that they, they wanted to pursue interests outside their company. They'd worked really hard for nearly 30 years. They wanted to realize the value of all that hard work and pursue other interests. So we started on the journey of exit, getting the business exit ready, getting the house in order effectively for the sale. Three years later, this business sold for 70 million pounds, which at the time represented a, a profit earnings multiple of 23 times. And during the three and a half years that we worked with this business, turnover doubled from 20 million to 40 million. But more importantly, the profitability more than trebled to over 3 million 
and the cash flow issues were resolved. And it's stories like this, which is why I joined the FD Centre. Some of the, the journeys we've been on, some of the journeys we're on now is exciting for everybody involved. And while I'm on the subject of exits, yes, it's really important that you get, uh, you have an FD. If you're thinking about selling your business, then having an FD to help put that, your house in order and get you ready, exit ready, is critical, really important. But what's also vital is having a good corporate finance professional firm behind you through the transaction and in the run up to that transaction. And there's no better corporate finance team I know of than PEM in Cambridge. So I think it's a great time now for me to hand over to Lake Falconer from uh, PEM. He's going to give us a bit of an insight into the world of M&A at the moment and uh, share some of the deals that are currently underway. Over to you, Lake. Thanks, Jeremy. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, like Phil, I'm a partner at PEM Corporate Finance. And in this last session, I'm going to talk to you about the current M&A market, uh, some realistic choices for um, an exit route in 21 and beyond, and rebooting uh, your strategy. So what is the current market like? Uh, well, if you listen to these guys, um, you would think it's all gloom and despondency, wouldn't you? Of course, there are some industries that continue to uh, really struggle, uh, but I reckon the media find it easier to find bad news than to check the pulse of the real economy. So to gauge the market, I'm going to look at our direct experience, our business confidence, and actual activity uh, in the marketplace. So, I mean, our direct experience is that Phil and I are spending our days talking to good businesses uh, that want to do things very positive. Um, on the screen at the moment are the deals that we did in the year from first lockdown to the end of March just past. Um, I have to say they almost all happened in the second half of the year, which tells you the story of what last year was like. But you can see it's a pretty active market. And to a fair extent, that's always driven by business confidence. This is business confidence over the last 10 years as surveyed by the Institute of Chartered Accountants. Um, interesting chart. There's the Brexit referendum, a bit of a decline after that. There's Brexit itself, and you can see a decline in advance, so it was priced in. Here we have um, the start of the first lockdown, and look what happened to confidence after that. And right now, we're on a bit of a bounce. So reading that, I would say, provided this continues, as far as business confidence is concerned, it's feeling a lot more like business as usual. What about the M&A market then? Well, here's data from Mark to Market. Phil mentioned earlier that a data provider we use for information evaluations and deal activity, looking for buyers or for targets. And what you can see here is that from a low point in terms of volume in May last year, broadly, deal volumes have continued to climb right the way through. And looking at the same data year on year, if you compare February last year before the lockdown with February this year, we're actually up quite meaningfully. So I think quite positive things to read from the market. What's driving that? Well, there's lots of liquidity out there, as uh, has been mentioned already. The banks and the private equity houses are hot to trot as are well-funded strategic buyers. And of course, thanks to Mr. Sunak, we still have a relatively benign capital taxes regime, which obviously encourages transactions. So if you are looking at exit, whether in 21 or beyond, what are your options? Well, I'm gonna look at four buyouts, employee deals, private equity and trade sales. I don't have time to go through these in detail. So what I'm going to do is give you a flavour of the differences and throw in some practical points along the way. So hopefully that's helpful. Firstly, the buyout. And I'm talking here about succession buyouts, where you as the seller initiate a deal to sell to your team. If you have a stable, profitable business with a good team, that's definitely a viable option. So the basic structure might be familiar to you. You sell 100% of the company to a new shelf company for a fair price. You're after capital tax treatment, so 10 or 20%. And it's typically funded by a mixture of cash in a company, a debt, loans from the seller, possibly private equity, and of course, management invest cash to ensure that they are committed. Some practical points, 
don't please just let your team go off and have a go at putting one together. Much better to take control, talk to your advisor, whoever it is, and put together a deal that you like that would also be a good deal for them. And in a post-COVID world, which is hopefully where we might be, then scenario planning is going to be really important. The structure mustn't burden the business. It's important that the company retains cash flexibility. Employee deals. John Lewis very much has been the poster boy for employee deals, although the fact it predates the current employee ownership trust legislation by quite a way. Uh, the new EOT legislation, to do that, you have to sell more than half the company to the trust. It's very tax efficient. If you're a seller, you pay no tax because the aim is long-term employee ownership. Flip side is really unfavorable tax treatment where you ever to sell a company later. Funding is pretty similar to buyouts, but a bit less flexible. It's difficult to get private equity in there because exits are difficult. And employees can enjoy a small tax-free bonus up to 3.6K per annum. The key conditions are that the trust must benefit all the employees on an equal basis. And the target has to be trading company. So practical points, I think, are around cultural suitability. You might need a different culture if you're going genuinely all employee. A question mark on motivation, perhaps. Do all employees feel different? And importantly, does management have enough skin in the game? I think you need to value your continued independence to do this because the disincentive to sell can limit strategic options. But both buyout and employee trust address succession and exit through employee participation. So it's quite interesting to compare and contrast them. And just without going through all of this, to pull out key differences on, on tax, employee trusts are much better on the way in, buyouts are better on the way out. Um, senior team motivation, I think it's better on buyouts, as is customization, which is slightly easier. Cultural retention, perhaps controversially, I think that's much easier in a buyout because an employee trust for most owner-managed businesses would involve a real shift to a much more custodial style of management. And motivation across the company, which is all important, I think is probably about the same in either case done properly. With apologies now to the private equity community, uh, who are not all sharks, it was, it was just far too good an image to waste really, there are lots of good investors out there who don't just bring you money, they actually add real value to the business and the strategy. These guys, if that's your exit route, prefer businesses making more than a million EBITDA with a consistent track record. They will bring a change in ownership style and of course it's predicated on a later midterm exit and they will need management to stay in and or to manage a staged exit of the seller. Practical points right now, as Phil mentioned, these guys have got lots of money to invest, funding a hole in their collective pockets. In terms of process, it can still move along quite quickly these days. We sold a business to a private equity house, closed last October, having signed the heads of terms mid-July. So about three and a half months for the back end process, which is not bad considering everything was virtual at that stage. And last, but by no means least, uh, you can consider trade sale as an exit route for the business. Broadly, two flavours here, a negotiated sale or an auction. An auction, of course, is where you get competitive tension between multiple motivated buyers for the business to get the best deal. A negotiated sale is where you're dealing with just the one buyer, often someone who may have approached you, and it's much harder to get competition. That's where uh, Jeremy and Jerry's team's work really helps because you can make a good impression having got your house in order. Practical points right now on this one, again, Phil's touched on this, is that consideration is much more likely to have some performance-linked element nowadays, given the increased amounts of uncertainty out there. So how do you choose or, or make a coherent strategy from these four uh, exit options in uncertain times? Well, the themes from Jeremy, Jeremy and Phil are really important. Get your house in order. And as Phil said, build your strategy back up from the ground. Now is the time to challenge it. And consider timing. I think that's really important. We use a traffic light system when we're doing exit planning reviews with businesses to assess timing. Now, this is just a made up example. 
and you can reflect on, on whether enough of the lights are green or, or amber for you. So this example, businesses in the great sector, that's a green light as it's having strong second tier management, but there's an amber light on, maybe it's too early, maybe there's a lot of short term growth to come and you wouldn't get enough value. It's a useful way to frame your strategy. And finally, it's really felt a bit like a battlefield out there for the last few months. So I think we can helpfully take a lead from the armed forces. Battlefield strategy is a series of iterative loops. So get your strategy going and keep testing it. If forecasting feels difficult, then do multiple scenario planning and reforecast more often. And so to summarize, we are busy doing deals and, and all four of these exit options are feasible. Pulling all the themes together from today's session, this is a good time to get your house in order. This is a good time to revisit your strategy from the ground up. It's a good time to start thinking proactively about growth, about acquisition, and about exit. Hopefully, the worst of the crisis is behind us, and it's time to start making plans again. Thanks, everyone. I'm going to hand back to Sean now. <clears throat> All right, thanks everyone for those. That brings our, our presentations to a close. Um, we now move into the Q and A. Um, so I have some um, some questions uh, ready to pose to our presenters. Um, just really following on from Lake's presentation, um, got a question here. So if I start a sales process now, won't the value of my business be depressed due to all the uncertainty? I think the short answer there is it will depend on your business, for some certainly, and that might uh, cause you to think about delay. But frankly, from what we're seeing for many business sectors, um, they're doing okay. Strategic buyers still see value. People are quite happy to adjust for what happened last year, so you won't be penalised if you've had a, a different year. Um, so in short, I think for most businesses, now is the time to start rethinking about it. We have a number of sale mandates on the go at the moment, which are running fairly positively. So um, crack on, but obviously if you're in a business where there are still a few challenges, then the question is more about timing and perhaps about delay. Thank you. Um, a question for Jerry. Um, the question is, um, my my partner is a is sort of bookkeeper in the business, um, but, the, the questioner is thinking about getting an FD into the business. Um, this is going to cause some grief. Um, so what would you recommend is the process for managing um, that kind of transition? This, um, thanks for that one, Sean. Um, yeah, we, we, we have a number of businesses within the FD centre which have grown as a uh, a family business and and where where one member is 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 leading the charge and the other one is 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 doing doing the the hard behind the work scene and and the honest truth is we'll we, again we'll go back to listening what's important for the business owners it might be that that partner actually can't wait to get shot of their responsibilities um looking after the books of the business it might also be that 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 individual um, feels limited by their own abilities and could do with some mentoring and and we'll listen to both scenarios and and any in between and we'll work with them to to to, to provide a solution that's that is uh to go back to what philip was saying that is both both uh able to grow and is scalable so uh so yeah it, it's it's a very often found situation it's not one that we run away from uh and like all of these things it can be handled well and sensitively so yeah thank, thanks for that whoever asked that that was a good one thank you and um so there's following on from that another one for the fd center jeremy might be well placed to answer this one um should we continue to outsource our operations or do we pull it back in house how's that going to really uh, help the kind of the, uh, the the growth strategy for the business that's an interesting question. It really depends what operations you're thinking about outsourcing um, and why. So, um, you know, there's lots of reasons for outsourcing. 
And one of the obvious ones is that you're using economies of scale and your core business is uh, focused on what you do and perhaps some of those services that, uh, that you outsource. The provider is the expert uh, and can do it a lot more cost effectively and probably much more effectively. So it's an interesting one. All businesses, as they grow, uh, they will get to a point where it might be more economic and make more sense to bring in those services, bring those in-house. But it's difficult without the context on this one, to be honest, to really say whether you should insource now or, or continue outsourcing, because I think each one would be a, an individual unique case. But uh, they're the considerations, they're the things I would think through uh, if you were thinking about uh, bringing something back in-house. Yeah, I think the outsourcing question, if the, uh, some that person would probably get in touch with Jeremy after the webinar, uh, you could explore that in more detail. Um, Philip, um, you, you mentioned um, your sort of 10 post-COVID strategies um, that inform an exit strategy. Um, which of those 10 is the most important? I think it's been touched upon by, um, by everyone's presentation, certainly, Jerry and Jeremy, um, uh, number one and, and number nine, basically the same one, which is um, cash flow management, detailed and robust cash flow forecasts, um, and, and, and keeping um, a nice buffer on the balance sheet for contingencies. Um, Jeremy touched upon the importance of, of, um, of working capital management when you're growing. Um, you need sufficient cash in the business to fund that working capital growth. Um, for sure, previous to, to, to PM, I sat as a finance director for, um, for a rapidly growing firm. And, and, and that was um, our, our main challenge, frankly. Um, we were growing rapidly, but uh, um, the, the growth was eating up um, working capital and eating up cash. So um, if, if we had had the help of the FD Centre at the time, I'm sure we would have coped the downside better than, than we eventually did. But, um, but yeah, it, it, you, can't, you can't take it too lightly. Cash flow forecast, cash flow management. Um, critical. Thank you. Um, this is a question that sort of come in prior to the event. Um, this one's for you, Lake. And it's a, it sounds like a simple question, but it may not be. Um, what are your top tips to negotiating a sale? Oh, gosh. Um, I think the top tips um, pick up on some of the themes here, which is actually really get your story sorted in advance. So get your house in order. Obviously, you have to have a business with good numbers, but you actually have to get out there and present the narrative. And that's the bit that a lot of people miss. You know, uh, we, we buy businesses and we see a lot of prep information packs, which are lovely, they're very glossy. They come out of the city and all the numbers are right, but it's boring or it doesn't really put across the message. And obviously, when you as the entrepreneur get in front of the seller, you're going to do a cracking job at selling the business, but you need to hook someone and, and get them in. So frankly, it's about how you present and manage the process. And I think the other top tip is around honesty. Uh, to be honest, you know, we've all heard the horror stories, for example, of private equity guys who come in and chip the price at the end, you know, the sharks in my picture. I think if you approach a deal in an honest way, you know, front the problems whilst selling the positives, um, you've got much more leeway down the track. You engender some goodwill for, for the time when you have to be tough in negotiation. Our house style is very much kind of iron fist in a velvet club rather than being aggro in people's face. You get better results and you get the best out of the competitive process that way. Thank you, Lake. Um, got a question here from Gary Nichols, um, which I couldn't point to Phil. Um, what are the key things that increase the multiple when valuing your business and what range of multiples are typical in a service related business sale? That's put me on a spot. Um, right. Okay. So in terms of things that can increase your valuation multiple look there, there are different multiples that are paid uh, in different sectors depending on um, what's happening from a comparable perspective right but i guess if i if i sit in the seat of a buyer it's all about risk mitigation and a different way of thinking about a multiple 
is is, is payback unit. So how long is it going to take me to get my money back if I'm a buyer? So if I'm paying a five times EBITDA multiple, it's going to take me five years. And if the risk is high on a business, so the factors such as there isn't a second tier management team, decision making is concentrated around the vendor who wants to leave the business, well, that's risky if there aren't the management controls and systems in place to replace that individual. If the reporting is really weak, and so during negotiations, you're placing material reliance upon factors that could change depending on whether you're placing reliance on the management accounts or, or the annual accounts that have been done on, a, on the back of a fag packet as opposed to by a professional credible firm. Anything that erodes confidence will reduce um, the appetite of the purchaser and have a downward pressure on, 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 on risk and, and multiple. Whereas on the flip side, anything that makes the buyer feel comfortable and increases confidence will, by logic, extend the length of time they're willing to wait for their money back, whether it be five, six, seven years or whatever. We, we see double digit multiples paid on kind of scalable businesses within the software industry. And that's basically because typically these businesses have good quality um, reporting lines in place. And frankly, um, uh, th th there's low risk in terms of money back because the revenues are growing and, and the systems are in place. Um, in terms of multiples paid for a service company, um, I'd, I'd like to invite uh, my colleague Lake um, in and share his his opinion. But I, I would I would say, look, you know, it depends on what your internal systems are, depends on um, what what the kind of level of uh, market growth is within your particular sector. Um, it depends on how big you are. There's there's an element um, called um, EBITDA multiple arbitrage, where the smaller you are, the smaller the multiples likely to be paid for your business. On the flip side, the larger you are, the larger the multiple, because typically if you're a larger company, you've got all the systems in place that reduce risk and increase confidence from a buyer perspective. But but what, what, what do you think, Lake? Um, service businesses are interesting. Sometimes people think you don't get a, a great multiple from them because they're, um, you know, they're just people and so forth. But actually, we've got a couple of transactions on at the moment where there's some pretty high multiples paid for service businesses. And I, I think it's... Um, it's yeah you're right phil the, the arbitraging thing is a key part of it you know we're looking at one where it's a cracking multiple for the business we're selling but the quoted business that's buying them is sitting on a much higher multiple so it's pretty easy how they make money out of that um so um it's a difficult one i suspect below a certain scale you're going to get kind of plain vanilla three four five six times but if you've got a big enough business, if you've got a niche in the market, people buy these sometimes just for having a cracking team with all the pre-existing relationships. So, you know, it's, um, well, I've seen double digit multiples of service businesses as well. So um, I'm really drifting towards the cop out of, it depends on that, Phil. <laughs> I, I, I passed you a hot potato, so. <laughs> Um, we'll just come to our final question as we're nearly at 12 noon. Um, I'll just direct this to, to Jeremy. Um, as regarding that building services client case study in your presentation, how long did it take to achieve those results? So, yeah, good question. Um, that's the, what I presented there was only half the story with that client, actually. So I focused on the operational aspects and the results that you saw there were... 18 months but what but what's important to say um, is that it's a, a lot of this stuff isn't sort of a, a way to quickly win and, and increase your profits and cash flow it is that it's a time game um, and what we do is we we work through and, and there we presented to you i think there were five or six uh key levers that we use there to improve the profitability and more importantly the cash flow but our experience is that this is something that uh, small incremental improvements over a long period of time is what makes the difference and it grows a sustainable uh, more profitable uh, and much more healthy business so i would say you know this is a, a, a speedy result and there are often low hanging fruit and i'm sure there are in in, in your businesses 
that may be um, are opportunities for you, but it really is a long-term game in growing your profitability, your cash flow, and certainly the strategic uh, elements will, will take a, a good bit longer. But I, it was that those results you saw t- today with the building services company, that was after 18 months. Thank you. Okay, now is a good time to draw the webinar to a close. So thanks for everyone who submitted a question. Um, So I hope our our speakers were helpful in their responses. Um, There were perhaps one or two other questions that we can follow up on we weren't able to answer today. Um, If anything else comes to mind, please don't hesitate to get in touch um, with our speakers. I'll circulate those contact details after the event, along with the recording and and the summary. Um, So that's it really now to say thank you for joining us and goodbye. Thanks very much, guys. Bye-bye. Yeah, thanks everyone. Bye.